Okay, so we'll start now because uh, now we have a limited time. So we reach seven o'clock. Okay. All right. Mm, good evening to you all. Uh, welcome to another uh, APC guidance program for a Middle East uh, Quantity Service Association. So I welcome you all on behalf of MEQSA. Uh, let me introduce myself. I am Mohammed Ifham. I am a chartered quantity surveyor. I am working as a contract specialist in a client organization right now. So with that introduction, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizer for MEQSA. Oh, my voice is not clear. No, it's okay. Is it clear or should I raise my voice again? Is it okay now? Is it okay? All right, fine. Oh, I got the majority votes. It's okay. So I will continue. All right. Uh, so I would like to thanks uh, for Middle East Quantity Saver Association uh, to give me an opportunity uh, to share my knowledge with you all, uh, with the fellow quantity surveyors and construction professionals. Uh, don't, the knowledge which I gain throughout my career. So just to share with you. So before we move on to the uh, presentation and the subject matter, I would like to convey you a few general messages. Like, uh, as you all know, uh, the life is short, the art is long. So whenever you are getting opportunity uh, to learn something uh, from anybody or from anywhere, so don't miss those opportunities. So you will get, you'll never get these opportunities back. So wherever you will get opportunity to learn something. Uh, sorry, uh, the voice still not perfect. I'm sorry, but I don't know where is the problem. My settings are okay. So what about others? Can all you hear me well or still any problem? I'm sorry for this interruption. Uh, okay, okay, so I will uh, take granted. So as I told you, uh, so the best thing is to develop your knowledge is uh, that whatever you gain from anywhere or from anyone, so you need to share this knowledge uh, to uh, someone who are in needs. So this knowledge, the, the best things to improve your knowledge, you need to share your knowledge with the others so from that way, you will develop your knowledge, you will enhance your knowledge. So uh, this is the part of RACS APC process. So may I know how many of you are sitting for RACS uh, session in the first session of 2021? Can you just uh, put a yes note in the chat box so I can see that how many of you are uh, already started this APC process. I'll give you one minute trying. <clears throat> All right, that's wonderful. So I can see uh, most of you uh, are uh, sitting for this RSES or uh, maybe some of you are planning, some of you are planning to sit the RSES you are uh, the potential candidates of RACS. And I know that I have noticed, I realized that some of you are uh, came to grab some knowledge, so acquire some knowledge. So that's also a good thing. So this is what I told you before. So in today's webinar, we are going to discuss some uh, key aspects of the commercial management of construction works. This is a part of RACS core competency, one of the core competencies so this core competency uh, for uh, those who are working in the construction, this will be uh, one of uh, core competencies. And those who are working in the consultant organization, maybe they may choose this competency as an optional. 
apart from that apart from this rscs this competency the commercial management is one of the vast area and one of the important area in, for all the quantity surveyors they should involve they are involving in their day to day life activities so whether you are working in a construction company or a consultant company you cannot avoid this competency and the matters the areas which you are covering is uh, more applicable to your day to day life quantity surveying practice okay so uh, as you know this is a kind of a master class so we are not uh, covering uh, all the sessions all the subjects in detail however uh, we will go through this rscs competency guideline and the requirements we will cover the requirements for rscs what rscs is expecting from this competency so to you to become a chartered quantity surveyor or chartered surveyor so through our this uh, one and a half hour to two hour journey we will be covering some important aspects of this competency right okay uh, also i would like to uh, tell you that whatever uh, we are discussing here whatever i am presenting here uh, do not take this as an advice uh, to your uh, day to day life issues in the commercial management so this is only for the purpose of academic purpose only so whatever whenever you need uh, you are you are come across for uh, any issues in your day to day life that should be uh, regarded as with its merits and you need to take more advice from uh, senior persons and is there any legal issues involved you need to take the legal uh, advice for a legal personnel so do not take these uh, academic uh, issues these academic discussions to your day to day activities but however the concept uh, the contents will be the same so you will use the same concept in your uh, day to day life what we are learning today all right uh, with that note uh, we will just move on to the subject uh, the commercial management so i want to tell you that uh, just try to make this session as an interactive session so this is not a one way communication what i am talking and you are just listening so if you feel anything uh, not clear what i am saying so you have to interact and you have to interrupt me uh, so to get the the things clear so if you feel anything while i am discussing uh, which is not clear to you or you need any more clarification or more uh, details please interrupt me and ask feel free to ask the questions or feel free to take your concerns all right i got uh, i think you got the things okay now we are directly uh, move on to the presentation so this uh, presentation as i told you before uh, this is majorly this will cover the rcs requirement in the competency so uh, this requirements uh, coincide with your day to day activities as a commercial management perspective okay so i will share my screen to you now just give a minute i will just uh, just hold the line uh, that just just hold on uh, give me a second okay right well Uh, so this is the presentation i am going to present to you this evening so i will go through it i'll run through the presentation and i will briefly explain uh, the slides so whenever as i told you you feel anything uh, you feel uh, if you need any clarification please uh, don't hesitate to ask okay All right uh, this is the cover cover sheet of the presentation can you see this presentation can you see the slides 
Okay. I hope you can see the slides. All right. Okay, fine. Uh, this is the organizers, the Middle East uh, Quantity Saver Association. So, as you know, they are doing an MNS, the uh, very good uh, job, very good uh, uh, the way they are dealing this uh, APC guidance program. So, this all can be accessed to this program. So, we should have a big uh, thanks for them organizing such a important uh, seminar series webinar series for all of us, uh, the quantity surveys and the construction professionals. <clears throat> so this is the program and uh, this is our competency, uh, the commercial management of construction competency. And this is me, okay, right. So this will be the uh, topics for our discussion. So I will list uh, the topics, what we are going to uh, briefly discuss in this session. So first, uh, helpful tips for APC, then RACS expectations in the competency, what RACS expect uh, as a chartered surveyor or ch chartered quantity surveyor, what, what you should know in this competency. Then we will go to the uh, topic of the competency, the commercial management of construction. So in this commercial management of construction, we will briefly discuss the following issues as a part of uh, APC process. So this uh, guidance, uh, these uh, headings I have taken from the RACS uh, guidance note. I will explain later uh, from which, which note I have taken. So this is in line with that RACS guidance note. So we will go through uh, introduction, uh, what is uh, briefly, what is commercial management and what are the definitions so available for commercial management. Then we will talk about uh, construction estimate and budget and value engineering and supply chain management, valuing works, understanding cost, cash flow, cost value analysis and commercial decision making. So, uh, these are the topics we are going to discuss today. <clears throat> okay, uh, this helpful tips for APC. I know that uh, since you are uh, you have started your process of RACS APC, most of you are aware of uh, this information. However, I want to uh, give you a brief introduction. Or I want to refresh your mind or refresh your <clears throat> thoughts just maybe uh, some of you are uh, new they are going to they are planning to uh, have this APC sessions and some of them are they will have these sessions in future so these documents the important documents are I will list the important documents so whether you are in the beginning stage of APC or you are in the middle stage of APC you cannot avoid these documents so just uh, for those who are already aware of this, take a note of this. So just refresh your mind. I will quickly run through the slides. Uh, these are the documents uh, very important when you are starting your APC process. So first one is the candidate guide. So there is a new version, August 2020. So this is, you know, after this COVID. So they are, have introduced uh, the video, the final interview now it will be on the video platform. So you can find the important guidance uh, of this video interviewing. So just have a look at, look on this one. This is the candidate guide, August 2020. The second document is the pathway guide. <clears throat> so based on your selection of the pathway, your pathway. So I am sure that most of uh, us are in quantity surveying and construction pathway. So. This pathway guide is very crucial and very important. So this is the latest version available with RACS, uh, August 2018. So just have a look at it. And the third one, uh, this is the RACS guidance note uh, for commercial management of construction. So this is today our competency. We are going to talk about it. So RACS has published a guidance note uh, for this competency. So you can find 
the vast details are available there. So uh, my uh, this presentation notes are based on this uh, RACS guidance note. So they call this uh, is a part of RACS black book. So what's that uh, RACS black book? RACS black book is the RACS has published uh, some guidance notes for most of the all of the areas of quantity saving and construction. So these guidance notes they have published they call black book. This is for good practice. So if you take whatever the competency or whatever the uh, guideline or whatever the subject in quantity saving, RACS has published their own guidance notes for good practice. So this uh, is called we call uh, black book. So this commercial management competency guidance note is part of that black book. So then uh, you can see in this pathway guide you can see the study checklist. So in the pathway guide, they have listed all the competencies, optional and core competencies and mandatory competencies. So in that competency list, at the last, you can see a study checklist for all the competencies. So go through it and you can find this study checklist, the items to be covered for commercial management of construction. Also, there is another RSCS uh, knowledge base is there, they call ISERV. So if you go to the RSCS website or if you Google ISERV, you can access some uh, wonderful notes and some very important and useful notes regarding the competencies, regarding almost all of the competencies. So this will be in ISERV. So you will have, if you can get the access of this one, it's much better and you will have a vast knowledge in that area. So these are the, uh, the cover page of those uh, guidelines which I have referred before. So if you take this one, this is that uh, candidate guide, August 2020. I just want to show you the picture so you will get understand uh, once you see those. So this is the pathway guide uh, for quantity surveying and construction. And this is the commercial management of construction. This is that I told you uh, the part of uh, Black Book. Okay. So uh, before moving to this slide, I just want to uh, tell you uh, there is one important note. Why we are using this uh, guidance notes? So there is a, a point behind that. So when we are using the guidance note, uh, there is a strong reason. First of all, uh, as you know, uh, maybe you are learning why we are using the standard method of measurement and why we are using the uh, general condition of contract like uh, FIDIC or uh, NEC or uh, those standard conditions of contract. What is the purpose of being using? Uh, one is that uh, those are the tested, well-tested documents and those are structured in a proper way and there are uh, more people familiar with this. So those are the main reasons we are using that uh, standard notes, like the standard documents and the standard method of measurements. In the same way, uh, the guidance notes, what RSE has published uh, for, to use to these guidance notes, because for example, if there are any allegation, if there are any like blame to the a chartered quantity saver uh, regarding his professional negligence. So in that case, the court or the tribunal, first they will look into that the this, this person, this uh, quantity saver, whether he has used the standard practice or not. So for an example, if he is facing any allegation on the commercial management part, uh, while he is doing a service to another party, so he had a problem. So the court will first check if he is an RACS member, if he is a chartered quantity surveyor, the court first will check whether this person is use this standard guidance not or not. So they will verify with RACS. So this is the important part of using these uh, guidance notes. So uh, through these guidance notes, you will get a uh, useful information. You will get uh, very helpful details you will get a vast detail, you will get a very good knowledge. In the meantime, 
it will protect you against any allegation. So if you are using this guidance note, it will help you to protect yourself. All right. Okay. Now, uh, this is the, uh, if you are doing RAC as APC process, these are the important uh, items you should know. These are the important documents you will come across. So this is the documents related to APC process. As I told you, you are all of you are most of you are well aware of this. However, I'm just refreshing your uh, mind. Okay. So this case study uh, and summary of experience, uh, the CPD records are so important, and the preliminary uh, or final submission and the final interview. These are the important documents related to RACS APC process. Moving on to the next slide. So this will be, this is very important. Uh, so when if you are doing an APC, RACS APC, just uh, keep in mind this, the what the things which I am going to tell you is the actual RACS expectation in the competency. This one I have taken from this RACS guidance. So if you are doing a commercial management of construction, if you are taking as a core competency, so you should have a three level of knowledge. This is what RACS expects. So the first case, you should have a knowledge on all the related components of this competency. For an example, if you take the commercial management, there is a cost involvement is there. There is various uh, value engineering options you will come across. There you will be dealing with the cost planning, budgeting, and uh, cost control, which we will be discuss in detail later. Okay. So in level one, what RACS expects is, I I put some examples here. Identify the components of cost for a work item. So these are the things. This just just an example. Okay. So you should identify the components related to the cost. So what are the components? Uh, I will tell you. Uh, for to derive a cost of a work item, you will be using uh, the we call first principle, the labor, uh, material, equipment and you will sometime subcontract prices or supplier quotations. So these are the elements containing a cost for a work item. So you should have the knowledge, you should have be able to identify these cost components for a work item. And same way, uh, you should have a knowledge on cost value analysis. We'll be using this cost value analysis for uh, identify the profit or to maintain the profit of a project. And you should have an understanding of design parameters that impact cost, for example, value engineering. So in this level one, RSCS expects that you should have a, at least have a knowledge on overall area of the commercial management. So if you go to further, if you go further in level two, what RACS expect is uh, the real life experience. So if you take the example, you will be preparation of cash flow and estimates. This normally all the quantity surveyors will do this one. So there's no doubt about that. And uh, some people you will be having experience in uh, CVR and this cost value reconciliation and cost to control activities. And all of you are, or most of you are involved in cost reporting, payment application. All. So this is the level two. Uh, these are the example of activities in a commercial management. You will be uh, having a real life experience in your day-to-day -day works. Is it clear for anybody? Do I, should I repeat anything? Just let me know, okay? Right, I hope it's clear for everybody or it's, it's, not, it's not clear at all. All right, the silent is, uh, I can take in both ways. You, 
you got everything or you got nothing i hope you get everything okay right fine and uh, moving on to the level 3 this level 3 is the uh, what we call that uh, you should be able to give the reasoned advice uh, in that case what rses expect uh, as i told you before uh, this level 3 uh, some some areas because say if you have no experience in a component what it says a candidate should have strong theoretical knowledge of the practical process and should be able to advise on the area so if you have no experience for an example i told you before uh, in your day-to-day -day activities some maybe you will do the cost value reconciliation but for some quantity surveys or commercial managers maybe uh, they didn't came come across this cost value reconciliation or some people i know that they are only dealing with subcontractors so in this situation what rscs expect okay the your work is okay that because because of your company policy or the company structure or your work environment uh, you cannot involve in all of the works but RSCS expect from you, at least you should have a theoretical knowledge. So, for an example, you didn't do any CVR in your life. Post value reconciliation, you did not perform at all. But you should know the theoretical part of the CVR. So you should know what is CVR and how you will prepare the CVR and how you will advise is there any issues arising from CVR. So the RSCS expects from the candidate, if he has no experience in an area, at least he should have a theoretical knowledge. So you cannot say that you don't have a theoretical knowledge. So that is not an excuse. So you, you have to grab this knowledge from anywhere. So if you don't have experience, you should have a theoretical knowledge on any of the components related to the commercial management. So I put some example here, uh, advice on the negative cost impact of any element in CVR. So as I told you, maybe you don't have any experience of CVR, but you should have a knowledge. You should have a theoretical knowledge of this process. And if anything, uh, happen at site or any negative cost impact if you come across you should be able to advise from your theoretical knowledge so same way advise the management on cash flow forecast and advise the site team on effectively utilizing the resources as per industry norms so these are some uh, practical and advisory level of this competency so every candidate at least he should have a theoretical knowledge all right, and uh, you can see this statement in red. So, you know, uh, now we are studying and we are doing so many researches and uh, we are conducting and we are reading books, we are writing essays. But the very important thing is also uh, RACS is expecting from uh, each and every its members, the Chartered Quantity Service, there should be a behavior there should be a good behavior and uh, you should behave ethically and professionally not only in your professional life but also in your personal life so this will bring <clears throat> even whether you have chartered or not or you are a, you are a professor or you are a doctor you are a scientist so if you don't have this uh, moral ethical behavior so that means like uh, you are from zero. So, so we cannot regard it as you a chartered savior, even if you have a big certificate with you. So keep in mind in at every time. So when you are uh, dealing with the people, like your day-to-day -day activities, you are dealing with your subordinates, you are dealing with office boy. Uh, so be kind on them. So show your professional uh, behavior. So don't show your like you are the only one. I am the boss. So you are, you know, not like that. 
so you should be a good man a good a reasonable man we call in legal terms you should be a good a reasonable man so in all of your aspects for example uh, you are driving a car say so sometimes you know uh, in this part of world we are facing so many issues on the road you know the behaviors of others the drivers but don't bother about them so you should show your ethical behavior so we know naturally we will get angry and we will get uh, stress while seeing those driving and they will you know but as a professional you you cannot do this one so you have to behave as a good and moral ethical character so this will enhance this this is the major for me actually uh, despite this uh, knowledge and uh, these things this ethical behavior in a personal and professional life is the one of the core uh, to show case as a good human in the society all right with that note i will just uh, in a nutshell i will just put this is the rcs expecting from you uh, to this competency you should have a thorough understanding uh, knowledge and advisory level uh, of the process and aspects used to achieve the profitability and the integration with overall project delivery so we will come to this uh, uh, profitability because th this is the uh, core of this uh, competency i will we will discuss further and uh, so the rcs expect from you that you should have understanding and you should have a knowledge of this all the competencies all the components and you should be able to uh, advisory go to advisory level uh, for these aspects whether you have experience or not so if you don't have experience at least you should uh, sorry at least you should have theoretical knowledge on them all right with that note uh, let's moving on to the uh, presentation and the study area so this is the commercial management so uh, this definition i have taken from caob chartered institute of builders so uh, what this says in construction commercial management refers to the application of skills to maximize the business potential business potential by ensuring the successful management of the project finances procurement and process that can impact upon a project's profile time scales and quality uh, by the way uh, am i fast please stop me eh, because i am just uh, going uh, due to this time restriction so we need to cover at least uh, some aspects so if i am uh, fast or if i am going fast just uh, just tell me okay right fine so this is the definition <clears throat> of the commercial management in the caob perspective <clears throat> and <clears throat> if you take uh, another definition <clears throat> sorry from institute of commercial management what it says uh, commercial management the identification and development of business opportunities and the profitable management of projects and contracts from inception to completion so if you see this one so in the first definition it is talking about uh, maximize the business potential uh, by ensuring the successful management of the finance so the, it, talking about entire process if you come to the second definition also it is also talking about the entire process of the from the construction company from the inception to the completion this is the whole process so this whole process what we are doing what to say if you take a project what what is the purpose of doing this project as a construction company to get the profit right so this is the core area this is the core aim of this commercial management to enhance the profitability so if you take the rscs uh, guideline rscs definition also exactly coinciding with these two definitions so what rscs says we will come into the next slides okay uh, next one is the commercial management uh, 
uh, we have a commercial manager. So the commercial manager is the uh, main co-person leading this commercial management uh, activities. So if you take uh, the office-based commercial manager, uh, sometimes there are two opinions. Uh, someone, all right, I should raise my volume, okay? Is it okay? Uh, give me a second. Okay. I hope now it's okay. Right. Mm, okay. Okay. So this commercial management, uh, we have a person. Is a co-person. Is a commercial manager. So. Uh, if it is uh, office based, uh, this is actually, I'm just telling the general perspective. Okay, so don't mix up with your company. Maybe uh, this will vary company to company. So you cannot take this is, this is not the Bible, by the way. So this is the uh, guidance notes which I have taken from RSES and the standard practice uh, in the industry. So maybe these uh, positions, uh, these arrangements will vary company to company. So office-based commercial manager, we call, sometimes we call the estimation manager. This is depend on the company uh, organizational chart, okay? And uh, we have a site-based uh, commercial manager. This is mostly the site-based activities. The commercial management will be dealt with uh, senior quantity surveyor. So he will have a, a team of quantity surveyors. So he will act as a commercial manager. So this office-based commercial manager, the major role is uh, in pre-contract stage. So from the decision, uh, the collection to tender, uh, the tender document, until uh, the submission of the tender, then once the tender is awarded, the once the project is awarded, he will take this uh, tender submission to the estimate to uh, prepare the budget. So this will be the major role of an office-based commercial manager, or sometime they call estimation manager, or there'll be both positions available in the company. The site-based commercial manager or the site-based quantity survey, uh, he will be involving uh, in post-contract stages. So in that uh, post-contract stages, this commercial manager is the one uh, who will be involving all overall the commercial management activities from the inception, the project, until the handing over. And apart from that, he will be having his, uh, uh, his involvement until the maintenance period and the contractor, until the contractors fully discharge his obligations under the contract. Okay, so these are the uh, two uh, level commercial management in the pre-contract and the post-contract. So these are the roles of the commercial manager or the estimation manager, maybe in your case, in the pre-contract stages. Uh, this is, uh, these uh, activities actually, uh, most of them are related to a tender and the procurement. So I will not go through in detail because uh, there is another competency in RSES, procurement and tendering. So you will be uh, learning uh, the, the core aspects of this pre-contract stage commercial management at that stage, uh, at that competency. So th that is dealing with uh, tenders mostly. So I will just read through this. Uh, so I will not go into detail. So these are the uh, areas you will be covered in another competency. So uh, from the collection of the tender, and until the submission, the tender submission, the whatever activities involved in the commercial management uh, perspective, uh, the, this commercial manager uh, will be in charge. He will be mostly in the head office. So from the collection of tender, then uh, once you collect the tender, then there will be a decision uh, from the management uh, to tender. So this decision uh, is, based on the report 
the once the tender is collected the commercial manager uh, they have he has to pro produce a high level report to the management so based on that report only the management will decide whether you will tender you will go for tender or not so uh, this report is very important uh, to enter into the contract enter into the tender so the commercial manager plays a crucial role a vital role uh, in this stage so he cannot simply give a report uh, by go going through this uh, tender documents so he has to do a very wide study uh, about the tender so he has to first look at the what is the project and who is the client and how is the client and what about the financial arrangements and all of this i'm just not in order this one i am just telling so these are the things the commercial manager should consider in pre-contract stage. So this is his uh, core duty. So uh, based on that, he has to go for site visit. Uh, he, this all you know that what are the things to be considered in the site visit. This all you will be uh, studying in that other, the tendering competency. So I'm just uh, listing them, okay? So once you decide to go for the tender, once the management give you the green signal, to go for the tender and you need to do all of this estimate so this first you need to make an estimate so this is the important part of this commercial management because this estimate only once you make an estimate it will remain until the project completion so uh, once you submit a price as a tender price you cannot change this tender price unless there is a requirement from the client side so this estimate you will use to compare your cost you will use as a budget to set the budget you will use this estimate so uh, once the things are set up the commercial manager should give a like a realistic estimate to price the tender so maybe the management will decide okay we don't want the actual prices just put some price because we have no job in the market we need to survive in the market just undercoat. But in that case also, the construction, the commercial manager should not uh, give any undercoat. He has to give the actual cost of the tender. Whether the, then he has passed this one to the management. Then that is up to the management to decide whether you will put a zero markup or you will put five percentage of market, just up to them. But as a commercial manager, he'll be accountable for his estimate. So he has to take care he has to consider all of the requirements, all of the contractual requirements, all of the legal requirements, all of the project uh, client requirements to price the tender. So these are the activities for pre-contract stage commercial management. Right, uh, this is the uh, as I told you before, the major uh, aspects of the commercial management is to, to enhance the profitability. So this profit, this is the commercial manager's duty to maintain this profit throughout the project life cycle. Okay, this profit should be achieved in terms of we call project goals. So you cannot simply say I am achieving the project but this project, this profit should be achieved. You have to consider three major aspects of the project. One is the time. So your project, you should deliver on time. And second one is the cost. You should complete your project within the allocated budget. Third one is the quality. So you have to deliver your product, your project, as per the intended quality from the client. So once you fulfill all of these three constraints, and if you achieve a profit by fulfilling these three constraints, that will be the best commercial management and the best uh, profitability project we can say. Because say for an example, 
you made a building and you use whatever the material you want you did not bother about the quality and you have used you just use in your own way you just completed you completed on time you got a big profit then you are proud of it okay now i achieved 50 percent which profit in my project but on the other hand there's no quality at all so once the client receive his uh, product uh, his uh, facility so he will see that there is no quality at all so what he will think maybe that will be the first and last project for you with that client so not only with that client you know this uh, in this part of world the most of the clients uh, are they are meeting together uh, maybe daily or they are discussing they are chatting so in that modulus we called they will say okay see i got this uh, contractor and uh, i spent so much of money and but at the end he gave me a rubbish uh, building so that will vanish uh, that will vanish all of your image in the construction market and that will be your end of journey so be careful and you have to fulfill all of these three project constraints or project goals when you are targeting the profitability so this is the commercial management that's why we are they are, we are having a huge uh, team of people in the commercial management or quantity surveyors your contracts managers you have senior quantity surveyors so wh why the contractor and uh, why the client are paying this much of money for this uh, commercial management because that is the major core part in the construction so they are will enhance they will make sure that this project will be achieve his profit but with consideration of these project goals okay so this is the purpose of the commercial management i explained you before so uh, as far rcs guidance they said uh, maximize the potential of a business in terms of profitability and project goals must be balanced so you cannot uh, achieve uh, time you cannot achieve uh, cost without quality or you cannot uh, you you will make a good quality and uh, you will achieve uh, cost but you are running out of time you complete the project far beyond the schedule so that should not be the case you have to complete your project by balancing these three project goals and the client satisfaction is very important as i said you so this may lead this will lead to more future projects from this client as well as so if you uh, give him a good product with his anticipated requirements he will recommend you for some other clients as well so you are you will get more more uh, projects so that will enhance your organizational uh, profit so if you take rcs uh, guidance uh, if or if somebody asks in the uh, apc interview what is the purpose of commercial management so you should be able to link this like you, should, you have to tell that it is the profitability to maintain the profitability in the meantime there should be a client satisfaction so if you meet these two criteria that will be the ideal commercial management so that will be the main purpose of the commercial management okay so that's why i have mentioned here uh, not only focus on profit but also need to keep a relationship with the client this is very important so in one project you can have 100 percentage profit but if you did not achieve this client relationship if you fail to achieve the client relationship that will be your end of your journey okay so be careful because uh, the market is uh, very narrow and there are big competitors there are more competitors so if you made a mistake a small mistake that can lead to an issue from the picture. Okay, so uh, these discussions mostly uh, 
related to the construction, but this can be equally applicable, apply to the consultant, or those who are working with the consultant or client. So you can use this, uh, these guidelines, uh, these uh, concepts uh, as appropriate. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, actually, there are questions, uh, but uh, as we have a short uh, time. I will suggest you, like, if you have any questions, just direct to the uh, organizers. Uh, maybe you can find their details on the flyer, or maybe you have their contacts, or there is a group for that one. So uh, just uh, put your questions there, uh, like um, important questions related to the competency. Okay, so uh, if I didn't get time to answer in this session, maybe I will take the questions and I will try, try to answer my best because you know, we are running out of time and uh, we need, we have small, short time to cover this uh, vast area. Uh, okay, so sorry for that one, uh, but I will uh, try to answer uh, as much possible. Please direct your questions to the organizers. Okay, fine. Uh, now uh, we will move on to the next uh, subject in the commercial management. Now, first we have discussed about the introduction to commercial management and uh, we have discussed uh, what is the purpose of commercial management, what is commercial management and uh, what are the roles, uh, the duties and responsibilities for a commercial manager. Now we will move on to the next uh, subject. Uh, this important uh, part of the commercial management is a budget and estimate. Okay, so the budget is, you know the budget. So this is the budget. Uh, we are daily talking about budgets. So what is your budget for, what is your monthly budget? Uh, if, you, if I ask from somebody, uh, what is your monthly budget for your uh, expenses in Qatar or in Dubai or in Oman? So that is the expenditure you are expecting. Uh, the expenditure within the month you are Okay, I'm going to spend this much money. Uh, uh, this includes for my housing, uh, for my uh, kids' schooling, uh, living expenses, utilities, and uh, food, uh, so on. So this the budget is the estimated plan of the cost to complete the project. So normally, uh, this uh, cost we are setting in the initial stage of the project. So once the contractor, the potential contractor receive, or he, is, he had a clue that he is going to receive this project. So he has to start this to set the budget. So this budget to be taken from the tender, the estimate what he has provided to the client. Okay, All right. Then uh, estimate. So this estimate is, uh, we call approximate cost of a project. So this is normally, <clears throat> we are doing this estimated pre-contract stages. So this approximate, approximate cost, we are taking, we are uh, deriving from many areas, from many aspects. The important aspects, uh, if you are take, take a tender, you will be having a detailed BOQ, right? So this detailed BOQ, if you want to make an estimate, so you have to use the first principles as I explained to you before, this is the first principle in the sense like uh, you have be using a labor, plant and machinery, uh, plant and materials uh, to derive a cost of the element. Then, or if, if this element uh, will be done by a subcontractor, you need to take the subcontractor price for that. So this is the estimate at the pre-contract stage. Next is the cost. So the cost, as you know, uh, this is the overall expenditure of a project. So this expenditure is including overheads, but excluding the profit. So if you see the definition uh, for cost in any of the standard methods, uh, sorry, general condition of contract, the cost is defined as the overall expenditure, including everything, including overheads, but excluding the profit. So if you want to have a prof if you want to see the profit, you need to take your income 
minus cost that will bring give you the profit so these are the uh, major uh, terminology you should know that uh, in construction budget and estimate right what can you see here uh, this person this is the candy okay the chocolate so he's trying to count uh, these candies or uh, say for an example he want to uh, count this uh, red color or white color candy so the quickest way the easiest way <coughs> that he, he has to estimate just estimate how many red candies are in the bottle so he cannot take and he has no time to take and count one by one so in the first perspective in the first case in the first instance if you get a project or if you get any uh, uh, project to price first what you have to do you need to make a rough estimate quick estimate because uh, if you take your higher management they will not bother about your uh, boq or take off or whatever so they will tell uh, once you get the tender say for example they will ask okay mr commercial manager i want to price i want to know we want to know how many how much this project will cost us so if you take a building say for an example so you should be able to in fingertips you should be able to give a rough estimate from uh, from your experience or from accepted principles you should be able to estimate that building in order the management to make a decision so this is the estimate so the types of estimate you know that uh, most of the contracting companies uh, they use this rcs nrm i think you all are aware of this nrm new rule of measurement so there are three nrms uh, published so far by rcs so just have a look at that because i am not going to uh, detail this one here so by using nrm nrm has set out uh, guidelines to how to make the estimates so have a look at it uh, on that so you will gain more knowledge on that one so this nrm you can use the pre contract stage uh, to set a budget or to set a estimate i will just tell a small example for this one say for an example in the design stage uh, you know the design stages right so you will be learning this one in the design design economics if you are taking this competency or in your day to day activities you can see uh, we have a uh, design stages so this design stages first the feasibility study so this feasibility study is very important for any kind of project then uh, when when you come to the design stages there will be a concept design there will be preliminary or schematic design there will be detailed design then ifc so these are the common uh, design stages so uh, based on this nrm uh, if you want to set a budget uh, to a project at the feasibility study okay i will take a example of hospital project so there is a client requirement to build a say 200 bed hospital so uh, the client is asking from <clears throat> you uh, to have a budget to have an estimate for that hospital so based on the design stage so if it is the concept design you don't have a detailed uh, drawings so you cannot make a quantity or you cannot make this uh, first principal uh, this one <clears throat> in that case you have to make an estimate using we call a functional uh, functional unit method for hospitals normally we are taking a cost per bed so if you know the cost of a bed per bed uh, from your previous project or from any database available you will get this cost and you will make necessary adjustment to sort this client requirement and other related factors to derive the cost of this new building new project so likewise this estimate will vary in the design stages so from the concept and from the schematic 
you have to use the the like uh, common principles like i said functional unit method or super, superficial area method you can use cost by square meter to set the budget with uh, this rcs called uh, nrm they are mentioned this cost limit this cost limit is the money the client should expend in this project so first they will set this cost limit and once the design is developed they will convert this cost limit or the cost plan they call in the different stages and it will end up with the detailed boq and with that detailed boq you will be making the detailed estimates okay so this is what i have intended the estimate becomes more detailed one as the design progressed due to the availability of more details so this all i have explained i will just quickly run through it tender will be priced based on detailed estimate contingency for risk and other uncertain issues budget shall be derived from estimate to reconcile so this is important so <clears throat> as i told you we are making estimate then this estimate should be used in the post contract stage to derive the budget why because in the post contract stage you are going to reconcile you are going to make a cost reports you are going to compare the cost against your budget so this budget this estimate what what you are priced in the tender it has to be used to derive your budget so that can be easily comparable okay uh, so that is the end of uh, budgeting and estimate now we will be moving to the another aspects of commercial management is called value engineering as all of you are aware of this value engineering let me check a chat box okay so these are the question uh, again so please uh, organizers have a look onto this uh, so we will we will try our best to uh, answer your queries right so the value engineering uh, this is an important part of the commercial management so we we'll realized why how why because when when you are going in your journey in the project sometime the project will go smoothly so as planned so there will be no need of any uh, alternative uh, designs or alternative uh, ideas so you will be delivering your project as planned and as intended then you will be getting your profit at the end but most of the time the due to the nature of the construction industry due to the nature of the works and the mindset of the clients the requirements sometime you will be having a trouble in the middle that maybe your budget is overrunning or uh, you need to cut short some uh, cost you need to reduce your uh, expenditure so most of the time this value engineering will help to do that one so as a definition value engineering is a systematic approach designed to maximize the value of a work component without compromising its quality or functional requirements so the value engineering what it says uh, i will take an example for this one okay so you are you are doing a building works and there is a requirement for uh, ac for an example window ac so if you check your cost sometime uh, you will be thinking the client will be thinking instead of window ac the split ac will be better better performance and maybe the cost wise it is uh, more so you need to do a value engineering proposal uh, to show that uh, this cost if you are changing the approach the functional requirement will be remain same so you can do whatever you want but within the context of the project specifications and if you are deviating from the project specifications uh, unless you prove that the functional requirement are met the clients are they will not allow you to change the project specs so if you can prove that this the change is meeting the client requirement and there is no 
compromising of the functionality, client will allow you to make some value engineering. So also you have to understand, you should be aware of this, this value engineering, not uh, always reducing the cost, okay? Because uh, you need, you no need to, not only to see the, the cost, the initial cost, for example, in my previous example, window AC versus split AC. Uh, split AC, maybe the initial cost will be higher. But you should take the life cycle cost. So from the inception and from its demolition of the building or demolition of that particular item, the end of life cycle of the particular item, you need to see the whole life cycle costing. So most of these, uh, you maybe you are aware of this green concept, the green building, green building material, you know, right? So you are, you are studying, this is part of RSES, sustainability and all. So these green buildings, normally, if you take the green building materials, the initial cost will be high. But if you take the life cycle cost, the whole life cycle cost, uh, it will reduce the maintenance cost. So at the end, if you take the overall picture of the cost, the cost will be less. So value engineering, not necessarily to reduce the value in the first stage. Maybe it will increase the value in the first stage. But if you take the overall whole life cycle cost, that will bring a benefit because the client will have a lesser maintenance cost. If you want, if you want to maintain in the building for 20 years, instead of paying small money at the first stage, you pay a little more money, the whole 20 years period maintenance cost will be less. This is the concept of value engineering. So if, if, if somebody asks, if RSES question asks, what is the best stage to do this value engineering? So what you will tell? Here, the inception to detailed design, these are the design stages. So the value engineering, as I told you, it is a systematic approach to maximize the value of a work component. So <clears throat> here there is a word, work component. So this work component, at which stage you can take it? If you take a building, for an example, uh, in the concept stage, there will be only some sketches will be there, uh, some plans will be there, and some elevations will be there. So there will be no work component. You cannot identify the exact work component in that stage. But if you move to the preliminary, the next design stage, the schematic design stage, they will divide this building to elements. They will put a substructure drawings, superstructure drawings, right? The finishes, the external works, so, so on. So in that stage, you will, you can be identified the work component of the building. So the work components can be easily identifiable from the schematic design stage. So to do the value engineering proposal, we can start the best, uh, the start point is at the schematic design stage, because in the concept, it's very hard to identify the work components or work elements. But in the schematic design or the preliminary design, where the elements of a building can be identified, it will be easy for you to propose any value engineering options without compromising its functional requirements. So this is the basic concept of the value engineering. <clears throat> and these are some examples of value engineering. Precast concrete versus cast in situ concrete steel frame construction versus concrete frame construction, wall tiles versus wall tiles plus paint in bathrooms, uh, road full construction versus thin surface treatment in a defective area. For example, if you take this last uh, fourth one, what it means that, say for an example, you have a road and there is a defective in one area, a small portion of the work, there is a damage due to some some uh, various reasons. So you, you have two options. You can do uh, only, uh, you can uh, clean that area uh, from, from top, you can remove the top layer, the wearing post or something, you can remove that one. 
and you can do a treatment to that. Or the, the second way, the best way is you can remove the entire portion from top to bottom, from up to sub base, you have to remove this road and you will do a new portion of roads in that area. So there are two options for you. <clears throat> for the, this defective uh, works, there are two options. So maybe this full construction is costly, right? To, to, to digging, uh, to removing the entire uh, road layers up to the sub base is costly than doing a surface treatment. But if you take the maintenance wise, which one will be the better? Of course, the full construction is less maintenance cost because in future, maybe this thin surface, maybe again it will get damaged, it will get removed. So you need to do again. So instead of uh, doing repeatedly with small cost, you can do at once the full construction in that area. This will initially give, uh, make uh, leads to more cost, but in the maintenance wise, it will reduce the cost. So this is the, these are some examples of value engineering. So these, uh, if you see, these all are related to construction methodology. So there is a competency for that one, uh, construction technology competency. So you will be learning more on that. Right. So now we got value engineering, and this is the third aspects of the commercial management, the supply chain management. Actually, this is uh, very crucial in the, in the commercial management perspective because you cannot uh, alone, say if you are a construction company, you cannot complete a project in any project. Uh, maybe a small uh, supply items or small things are okay. But if you take a construction project, you cannot alone complete a project. You should have there will be more stakeholders, uh, more parties involved in the process. So one of them are the supply chain management. These people, uh, those who are dealing with uh, supply chain. So the supply chain management is a very vital part in any construction project. So you cannot simply avoid the supply chain. Okay, what, what are the people? Who are the people involved? In the supply chain, they are mostly subcontractors, suppliers, subconsultants, or any third party testing agents or whoever, and any other party in the supply chain of the project delivery. So these people are involved to deliver the project. Maybe the stages may vary. So suppliers, maybe they're involved in the middle. Maybe subcontractors, they will be involved from the beginning. The third party consultant, they will involve at the end. But these all people, together we call supply chain. So this supply chain will involve in a project at various stages. So <clears throat> what commercial manager should do in the supply chain? So first he has to uh, make agreement with the subcontractors and suppliers, right? So once the project is awarded and uh, he has to identify uh, what are the areas we can go with the subcontracting and what are the materials we require from the supplier. So he should identify those items and he should make an agreement and he should then administrate the contract with the parties in the supply chain in a proper manner. So once the these parties on board, the commercial manager should administrate their obligation, their rights and obligations, a proper contract administration should be there to administrate these subcontractors. And he has to plan the procurement in prompt stages. So as per the procurement plan in the program, the commercial manager should arrange the procurement in a timely manner to deliver the project. And commercial manager should value the works and timely payment to the supply chain. So this is the major task because if he delay any payment, if he unnecessarily delay any payment to the supply chain, that will be ended up with disasters, right? So this is very important. So that's why I put in red, these points, 
the scope of work shall be defined clearly and precisely among subcontractors and suppliers. So in a complex project, we will be facing a lot of problems if there will be, say, hundreds of subcontractors. And if you are not defining their works properly, uh, they, it will be ended up with uh, more coordination issues and uh, <clears throat> lack of scope. There will be scope gap will be there. So for that one, commercial manager shall use the scope matrix to define the scope of each and every subcontractor. And he has to provide uh, markup drawings for the scope demarcation. So for each and every subcontractor, so this will be clearly identified. Then it, it is it facilitates to the quantity service also while preparing their payment application to the subcontractors. And also they have to define clear coordination between subcontractors. And ultimately, as I said, the supply chain should be happy, right? So if they are not happy, what will happen? Maybe if you if you lose your supply chain in a project, for for the next project, you will be having a new supply chain. So you are have to go for a new supply chain, new subcontractors, new suppliers. <coughs> so if you keep this, sorry for that. <coughs> Right. If you keep your existing supply chain to the next project, you will be getting more discounts from the subcontractors and suppliers. And those people, you are familiar with those people and you can deal with them easily. Also, uh, the contractual terms, the agreement, you can use the same agreement based on the type of the project. You can use the same term those terms are already agreed from the subcontractors, right? So you can use the same same terms and conditions to the new project. So that's why uh, this uh, keeping relationship and uh, keeping uh, supply chain, they should be happy. So they should be happy mean uh, that not you are paying or paying, right? Not you are giving more money. No, you have to pay what they have uh, as per the contract. So as per the contract, what they have entitled, you have to pay. But you have to pay on time. So, okay, this is the major idea behind this uh, supply chain management. Right, the next item is uh, volume works. Maybe I may go a little faster, right? Because normally, well, what time is the, uh, like end time, you know, from seven to 8.30 or can, go up to nine o'clock, is it okay? Anybody have any idea? <coughs> Two hours, okay, right. Okay, I will I will quickly go up to nine o'clock, okay? I'm sorry for taking your time, right. So volume works, so this volume works, you know, this is the valuation. <coughs> so the commercial managers are involving this volume works. So it means uh, there is a separate uh, guidance note. As I told you, these guidance notes are there in RACS for interim valuation and payment. So just refer this one, so you will get more idea on this valuation, okay? So this is the uh, main point of value work. It's calculating the value of work done in a given point of time. So normally this is, we all know, the interim valuation. So interim payment application. So this is the one. So normally we are doing in a monthly basis because this valuation is very important for the contractor uh, to get his payment, what he has done at site, right? To maintain his cash flow. So the best practice, uh, we all know that we will be doing this in a cumulative basis, uh, not like a supply or LPO. We are doing on a cumulative basis. And uh, also we need to consider about these variations and claims to be included, okay? And the uh, payment mechanism or contract type to be checked. So what is this payment mechanism? Payment mechanism means if you take any contract, uh, they, will be, uh, they will define the contract type, say a lump sum contract. So that is one of the payment mechanism, a lump sum contract, or we can say a contract type or a remeasured contract, 
that is also one payment mechanism and cost plus contracts uh, we have target contracts we have uh, guaranteed maximum price those are the payment mechanisms so uh, when you are valuing uh, making your payment application first you should read the contract you have to read uh, there is uh, no uh, options you have to read entirely and to understand the contract to understand the terms and to understand the contract type before you make the payment <coughs> so uh, for an example uh, if you valuing the works there will be many items you will come across in the boq one item is the preliminaries so this is uh, you have fixed items you have time related items you have method related items so i am not going to go into detail because this one also there is a competency a quantification uh, in construction so you will be learning more so just i am just highlighting the major uh, points here okay so normally even though if the time related charges are there what the consultants doing are doing they are just changing this uh, in the preamble the pricing preamble to progress related so uh, once they will pay you this some of the items this time related items they will pay you against the progress so if your progress is less you will be getting less payment so just to make sure just to read your contract just to read your pricing preamble how these preliminary items are paid so you need to take a note on that also material on site material off site the retention these are not uh, progress related right so these items you should be able to claim uh, once uh, they are uh, at site or there if there is a provision for material off site you have to claim the material off site and you need to take care about the retention what are the percentages and what is the limit of retention this all like uh, payment related so i am just saying so these items just take care of these items okay okay if you go to the valuation uh, there will be two types of valuation uh, this is what uh, normally we are practicing some companies they are practicing this one on this is the rcs also they have categorized the valuation into two portion one is internal valuation this internal valuation is uh, we call uh, this is the actual <coughs> actual work done so the actual work done uh, is the we call internal valuation this is internally so uh, within the organization we will use this valuation and also this will be used in the cost reporting <clears throat> so the internal valuation is to assess the value of work done against the project budget so as we said before you have a project budget so to compare this project budget how this budget is maintaining you have to do this internal valuation this is the same the payment application but what you will do is <clears throat> you will uh, make the actual work done uh, and you will give to the management and they will have an idea on your status of the project and we call uh, the second one is external valuation this is the one we are submitting to the consultant or engineer or client for payment so this is the contractual entitlement our contractual entitlement as a contractor this is the internal well external valuation okay so the external valuation is to claim from the client so this is the interim <coughs> claim you are making monthly for the final uh, final payment so this we called external valuation right <coughs> as you know that uh, in most of the cases if you take the internal and external valuation that won't be same there, there there will be different why is that because some items you claimed but there is no inr or there is no inspection request there is no ir we call so in that item <coughs> your internal valuation shows that you claim this one. for example you claim a plastering work 
but there is no INR for that plastering work. But this work has been done actually. So you will show this one in your internal evaluation, plastering. Then you will try to claim this one in your external evaluation as well. But what the consultant QS, if we check this plastering and he realized that there is no INR for this one. So what will happen normally, he will not pay for this plastering at all or you can agree with him a percentage value for this plastering. So this is the difference. That's why this internal valuation and external valuation is not going to be the same. And sometime uh, you brought more material to the site and this is uh, you can because since you are spending this one, maybe you will show in your internal valuation. These are the materials available at site. But if you see your contract, unfortunately, there's no material on site provision. So you cannot claim these materials, even though you have incurred this cost. Right. Uh, likewise, uh, on the construction sequence. So for example, uh, <clears throat> you have completed the form work and, but there is no INR because some consultant, they will take INR only for concreting. So if you finish the concreting, they will pay all of these items for work reinforcement. If these items are combined, uh, I'm not talking about the separate one. If the form work reinforcement and concrete are combined in one item, some prime you will be not getting paid for form work alone if you completed the form work. So you have to wait until the concrete is casted. So then you will be getting the full payment or some consultant, they will pay some percentages. This is depend on their uh, strategy. Okay. Right. And uh, you, you will be having some overclaimed item as usual uh, as a contractor QSS. I know that. Uh, they'll be claiming some uh, more. They'll be claiming more percentages because you, they know that some consultants, they want to cut something, right? They want to deduct something from the contractor, even though the contractor has submitted the actual percentage, a genuine percentage of the claims. Some consultants, this is by nature, so we cannot avoid that one. Uh, they will try to cut something. They want to reduce something. They want to show the right. Uh, we are also working. We are also checking, right? I am not disregarding the <laughs> consultant. So this is happening uh, in life. So <clears throat> sometimes in that purpose, the contractor QS, they will claim more. So this claim, maybe you will show in the interim uh, internal valuation. But if it is, comes to the external valuation, the consultant will reject this one and he will not pay. So he will pay as per the actual progress. And also, for example, if you take uh, concrete, <clears throat> sometime the consultant will not pay 100% until the test results of the cube test or whatever it comes. So even though you have completed your concrete works, you will be, uh, you will not get paid because of this pending testing works. So that is another reason the internal valuation is not equal to the external valuation, right? So in that case, uh, if you take the difference of this internal valuation, external valuation, so these are the items I have explained you. Uh, so these are the items I have explained you the reasons of uh, the change. So this change, if it is more, they call overmeasured from the internal and external valuation. If it is less, it is called undermeasured, right? Okay, so now we have finished the valuation. So that is simple, everybody knows. So just I want to highlight the important aspects. So now another uh, main uh, aspect is the cost. The commercial manager or the commercial uh, quantity server, they are always dealing with the cost. So this section, uh, we are going to talk about these cost elements. So used for the reporting. So this cost reporting is one of the key aspects of the commercial management. So that is the way we are going to control the cost. We are going to monitor the cost. And at the end, ultimately, we are going to see 
where is our profit as intended, right? So this is the section about the cost. So there is a special uh, guidance note from RSES, our cost reporting. So just uh, go through it and you will be gaining more details. <coughs> so uh, this, cost, uh, this cost control, the cost report I have mentioned in the first bullet point, it is uh, mostly related to the construction organization. So if you are uh, working with the consultant or with the client, you can refer there is a separate competency, project finance, control and reporting in RACS. So you will be learning all the cost related uh, issues, the cost aspects of the consultancy in that competency. Right, the, the cost is how we will calculate the cost. So uh, for the purpose of cost reporting is the for a given point of time, we, the, the total cost incurred will be taken from material, labor, plant, subcontractors and others. So this is the day-to-day -day activities you are dealing with. So the total cost, you have to take the total cost. If you want to compare the cost and your value to, to the budget, for a given point of time, you need to first take the total cost incurred. So this total cost incurred will be taken from this way. <coughs> Then this cost information, as I listed in the previous sheet, uh, labor. So how you will take the labor cost from where you will take? You will take from the time sheets. You can have their productivity. You can calculate the how many hours they have worked. And uh, their money, their payment, you can take from the salary. And for the plant and machinery, uh, you will be having your own plant or hired plant or hired equipment and vehicles. This will be available in stores or with uh, logistic. You can take from there. And for the cost of the materials, you can take from the purchase order or local purchase order or invoices, so on. And for subcontract, if you are giving a subcontract, you have to take the subcontract agreement and sometimes purchase order LPO to find the cost. <laughs> like uh, other cost, for example, this utility bills and stationery, sometimes uh, consult and treat. I don't know whether this part of the world you are doing this one. Uh, sometimes we have to give some treats to the consultant. Uh, this is not the bribe maybe. Uh, sometimes if you are, uh, doing concrete this, the consultant people uh, will stay for a long time maybe you have, need to provide some refreshment this we can take as this so this is also cost so this cost you can take from the accounts or from any hr personnel and uh, accruals these accruals are very important because the accruals are like this is uh, not yet paid but for example uh, if you are taking any material uh, you did not pay, but you ordered the material. <clears throat> so the material didn't come to you, but still uh, you ordered and you placed an order. So there are sometimes the good, uh, these materials are there at site. You did not incorporate into the permanent works. So this uh, we can call accrual. So for this accrual, you will have delivery notes and you will have some subcontract accounts to find what are the accruals to include in your cost. Then some ordered material, but not yet delivered. So for example, if you take any uh, material, if you want to uh, take from foreign, for say for example, if you want to take uh, granite from Italy, so you will make uh, the letter of credit, LC sometime. So you will be paying for this LC. You are already open for LC. So, but the materials are not yet delivered. So these materials, these costs also, you need to incorporate into the cost plan. Right, <clears throat> so as I said here, setting the elements of cost at an early stage of any project is a major task of the commercial management. So what does this mean? Uh, this is mean that you need to uh, set these elements 
of course no? this uh, for an example if you take a work work element say uh, say plastering for simple example okay so this plastering what are the elements involved in this plastering so you need to define at the early stage when you are defining your rate breakdown and when we are doing your budgeting you need to define for each and every work item what are the elements the material labor and plant and subcontracting should be included so this is the major task of the commercial management right so if you didn't do this one at the early stages properly then you will be facing a huge miss in your subsequent activities why these cost elements uh, are the major elements to monitor throughout the process so if you missed anything say for an example for plastering if you missed uh, cement so that will be very difficult for you to find and if you want to include it again you need to rearrange all of your cost coding and all right so for this purpose we will use the cost code and cost centers these are the two major terminology so, so just keep in mind uh, in, in the construction in a construction uh, project sorry for that okay for the construction project for the commercial management this cost code and cost centers are important so if you are in rses uh, they ask about this cost reporting and you have to make uh, these are the keywords cost code and cost centers so the cost code for example this is the uh, like uh, okay i will come in this way cost center cost if you take plastering as a cost center this is one uh, work item the line item so of course center is plastering for an example okay so in that plastering you will have different elements like cement sand uh, labor equipment any accessories right so these elements are we call cost code so this cost codes normally in the construction companies they will have a centralized system or they will have a computerized system uh, to define these cost codes and then these cost codes will be linked to the cost centers so if you want to find the cost of this cost center plastering will be having so many cost codes so cost of these cost codes together will give you the cost of this cost center right so this is the basic idea of how to define and how to set this cost code and cost centers for a project so as i said there, there will be a centralized system in the company the, in the large companies it will be linked with various departments so accounts logistic hr because if you take accounts they will be using certain data uh, and hr they will be using dealing with salaries and all so this all are interrelated and linked to these uh, cost codes so if you correctly define a cost center with these cost codes then you will get the correct cost of that one okay now we are moving to the cash flow uh, we are running out of time so i am just uh, i'll go through it quickly okay cash flow there is a separate uh, guidance note uh, in rses <laughs> so just uh, have a look at it and what is cash flow why it is important there is a famous uh, statement uh, from uh, lord denning uh, maybe you all are most of them are aware of lord denning lord denning is a prominent uh, judge in uk who was uh, involved in the many landmark cases okay so what lord denning said in one of the case in donways which minter or modern engineering with gilbert that lord denning says cash flow is the life blood of the building industry right so it's the blood so without blood your body will not be functioning so without cash your construction your building or your project will not be feasible <coughs> right so this a cash flow is a very important for the construction sector right so what is cash flow it's simply the cash in and cash out though as a contractor cash in you will be getting cash in 
and this is the payment. Uh, if you take a project, uh, the payment from the client or the cash in, cash out will be all of your expenditure towards this project. Your payment to subcontractors, payment to the materials, your salaries, your wages, your bonus, this all regarded as cash out, right? And if you take the cash flow, there'll be two types of cash flow. One is the we call project cash flow. This is what I have talked about it now. And the second one is organizational or corporate cash flow. So organizational cash flow is the cash flow of the company. So if you take a big construction company, the company will be having more than one projects, two, three projects. So this uh, individual project cash flow of the projects will be linked, will be linked to the the main cash flow of the company, that's a corporate cash flow, right? So the commercial manager needs to ensure the positive cash flow to avoid expensive borrowing. So if your cash flow is negative at a point of time or in this from the start of the project, you should be commercial manager should be able to uh, forecast this one and to make necessary actions to uh, avoid the borrowing. Because if you want to borrow the money, that will be, uh, you will, you have to pay extra charges, interest and all. But if you know the organizational cash flow, and if one project suffer from cash due to any reason, sometime what first case, the company, the commercial manager should go and look into the corporate cash flow. He has to check from the head office. And if any project having some excess money, which can be utilized to this project, this is the first case the commercial manager need to look after. Right, so that's why we call early warning and forecasting help to arrange alternative fund. So if you need any fund, if you need, if you are short of any fund, you can use this alternative arrangement. Right, so why we need the cash flow? So these are the reason company to pay its debts as a part of obligations and liabilities. So excess money to make investment. So if you are getting excess money from a project, so sometime the company will take those money and it will make some other investment uh, somewhere else, right? Also, it helps to avoid borrowing. This is uh, some cash dollars, right? And these are the required documents. So if you want to prepare a cash flow in the initial stages as a contractor, you should have a contract document, right? So you should be referring uh, not only the BOQ, not only the payment terms, you should refer the entire contract, your contractual obligation, you have to refer, and you should be thorough in the contract provisions. So you will be knowing that while you're preparing your cash flow, these are the things to be considered. And uh, you should have a baseline program. So you'll be using this program as a basis of your uh, progress. So then you will calculate this, your monthly uh, cash in and cash out based on this progress. And also the subcontractor uh, supplies agreements. You have to see their payment terms. You have to see their agreement, how the payments is scheduled and how much the advance payment, so on to prepare the cash flow. So these are the considerations uh, when you're preparing a cash flow forecast, we call that cash flow forecast, right? Uh, you have to start the cash flow preparation until the end of the project. You will be forecasting how much in a particular time or particular month, how much the money is going out and how much it will become. So this is the, this is, we call cash flow forecast. So to make the cash flow forecast, first we should know, is it for the contractor or employer? So this cash flow, the preparation will be changed uh, that with the type of business. So if it is contractor, he has to base a project base. If it's an employer, maybe he has to make a project base. And if he has more project, he has to make an organizational corporate cash flow. And also for employer, uh, not only he has to pay to the contractor, he has to pay to the consultant sometime, he has to pay to the designer. So this, uh, cost to be considered when preparing the employer's cash flow. <clears throat> then we need to see the adjustment uh, to holidays and summer timing. 
this is very important so because if you see the program sometime uh, in ramadan and in summer we will be having a less working time right so your productivity your output will be less maybe your cost will be the same you the cost will not be reduced because you have to pay the salaries for staff you cannot reduce the salary because of the time but your uh, income because of your work progress is slow less timing it will be impact so you need to consider those things and uh, pretension percentage you need to consider defects liability period because of the duration some we have one year some we have 400 days so you will be getting your final retention after this 400 days or after one year so that is matters that is affecting on the cash flow and variations claims and material on off site you need to consider so effectiveness of the cash flow forecasting is depending on accuracy of inputs and regular updates do not forget to list all the data used to forecast the cash flow so these are the major uh, important points when you are making the cash flow so you need to regularly update uh, your cash flow right and you need to give accuracy is very important you need to use accurate information if you use anything that not accurate it will impact all of the whole cash flow and you have to list whatever the assumptions or whatever the considerations you have taken when preparing the cash flow you need to make a list and keep with you because if the management ask why this in this in this point why cash is not uh, why is reducing or why you take this one why you didn't consider so you should have a list of these considerations and assumptions which you use to produce your cash flow right so these are the actions and uh, pre and post contract to avoid the negative cash flow so what is negative cash flow the negative cash flow is the uh, cash in will be less the cash out will be more so you will be spending more money but you will getting less money this is called negative cash flow so uh, in the st start of the project in the start of the project you will be having a, a lot of works like preliminary works the site arrangements you need to make a site arrangement you need to mobilize the site so these are all you need to prepare make an advance uh, sorry performance bond you need to uh, procure the insurances so these are all you will be incurring lot of money what if you don't have any advance payment in your contract so that is the major negative cash flow point so if you don't have any advance payment you have to borrow some money so you have to use your company uh, shareholders fund or whatever to do this one so that's why the commercial manager uh, can you remember i said i told you when the start of the presentation uh, while he is doing a tendering he is deciding whether to go for the tender he has to look whether there is an advance payment provision so if there is no advance payment and if the commercial manager realized that one in the beginning first he has to ask from the client during the tender stage to provide an advance payment to facilitate an advance payment or if the client is unwilling the client is not facilitating any advance payment he need to mention in his report at the tender stage this project has no advance payment but we will be incurring more money during our site setup in the initial uh, stages so the company has to arrange the cash so the commercial manager should give a clear picture to the management that there is no advance payment though this will impact the cash flow so there will be negative cash flow so this is one and uh, if it is uh, anything happen negatively also he can uh, go to the supply chain and uh, with the agreement of the party the subcontractor he has to negotiate he can if he can extend their payment right so that's why that is the reason we are saying that we should keep this supply chain healthy we have to Uh, not to stress the supply chain not to excuse the supply chain so we should maintain a good relationship because if we make any if you face any difficulty like this so
so we can go to the supply chain and we can request so they will be able to help and uh, expedite the works so complete in timely manner so if you feel any negative if you come across any negative cash flow what the best thing the best thing is to do is you should complete the project in a timely manner quickly because if you complete it quickly uh, you can save a lot of money right the expenditure the monthly expenditure all the these uh, payments and the salaries if you complete the project on time the most of these cash flow issues can be avoided right and also uh, commercial manager need to identify the variations and take prompt actions as a part of the contract okay and manage the resources properly avoid unnecessary wastage of materials so sometimes this cash flow maybe will be negative because of the misuse of uh, misuse at site or the less productivity or the construction manager he fails to maintain the required productivity or the people at site they are wasting too much material it means that uh, you will be spending more money to the material so your material component the cost will be high so you will be getting negative cash flow right uh, this is the next part of the presentation this is the cost value analysis and uh, cost uh, value reconciliation uh, is called we call profit and loss statement okay so but uh, the time is running so i don't think uh, i have another maybe 10 slides so th this is the one of the important uh, area of the commercial management so this is the how we are controlling the cost these are the major tools if you see uh, I'll be show. I'll show you. Uh, these are the major tools we are going to use. Uh, we are going to study uh, the cost controlling of the contracting company in post-contract stages. So this cost value reconciliation, or we call cost value comparison, and uh, cost to complete. This is one another tool. And nowadays, uh, earned value analysis is becoming popular. So this, these are the three major items we are using to control the cost and uh, to ensure the profit is uh, maintained. So I think uh, with this uh, time frame, uh, I couldn't finish, I couldn't complete this one. So what's your uh, opinion? Uh, shall we continue or we'll stop and maybe if the organizers allow, we can have another session sometime after or just tell me your opinion. So I don't know what to do now because of the timing. I couldn't complete this one. Maybe I slow or uh, I talk some unnecessary things or I don't know, just you need to tell. Yeah. Mm, okay, so majority is continuing. Uh, is it okay for others? For me, <laughs> I have no issue, but you will be having... Uh... Okay, continue better. Right, fine. I will continue. Okay, so uh, the next item in the presentation, the, the, in the commercial management is... Sorry. Just a second, please. <clears throat> okay, now we are in the cost value uh, analysis. This call, this sometime call, uh, profit and loss statement of a project. So in this uh, stage only, we will know that what about the project profit. So we are analyzing the project, the profit, how it is, where it is in the uh, context of this cost report. So this is the cost reporting system in the post-contract stages of a construction organization. Okay, comparison of cost and value at a given point of time. So we are comparing here. We need to compare the cost against, we need to compare the value in the same point. Eh? So the cutoff date, <clears throat> if you are using the your payment application, you will be getting your money. So this payment application, you are having a cutoff date, right? So the, we had to use the same cutoff date to calculate the cost. So then only we can compare the like to like, okay? 
right all costs including accruals to be considered comparison should be in a common platform what is mean uh, you should compare say if you are using a boq uh, if you use boq to produce your budget you have to use the same boq for to uh, claim then only you can compare the claim and budget so if you are using vague uh, vague breakdown structure uh, if you use for budget you have to use the same wbs uh, to calculate your value then only you can compare also you need to consider about the risk and contingencies so if you allowed during your estimation if you allowed any risk or if you allow any contingency okay so uh, you will know that at the end of the project or at the middle of the project this contingency will not be used but you have allowed some amount say 1 million you allowed as a contingency so uh, during your uh, course of construction you did not utilize you didn't utilize that 1 million so what does that mean that 1 million is a profit for you right so because you didn't use that one but you allowed in your budget okay that is what it called then uh, <clears throat> these are the as i explained you these are the three tools we are using for a cost value analysis we will go one by one briefly okay this is first one cost value reconciliation also it called cost value comparison so as the name suggests you are just comparing the cost versus value the tool used to ensure the profitability in a given point of time so what is the profit the cost minus sorry the value minus cost right so once adopted properly decisions can be made related to utilization of labor plant and materials <clears throat> so the comparison of the cost and value so the value is you are getting from the client the payment for example in the month of december end your value the payment from the client say 100 million so in the same point you need to calculate the cost so to calculate the cost i have explained you before in this heading understanding the cost I have explained you uh, how to calculate the cost. So this cost, cost can be calculated from this understanding cost. We have calculated you know, the first principle from labor plant machinery and from cost code, cost centers, right? So in that given point of time, your cost will be 90 million. Okay. So your value will be 100 million. Your cost is 90 million. So the 10 million, the difference is your profit, right? Okay, so this value from internal valuation. Eh? So the value is from internal valuation. Cost to complete. So this is the second tool. First tool is your clear, right? Cost value reconciliation. You're using the value. There is a payment application. And the cost from this uh, cost code and cost centers. So you will be comparing. Then the difference will be giving you the profit. The second uh, tool is cost to complete. So this is normally we are not doing monthly, depend on the company strategy. Uh, generally, we'll be used, uh, doing in once in a three months or as per the company requirement. Okay, it is the forecast of the required cost to complete the remaining works at a given point. <coughs> as per the obligations under the contract. Say for an example, now, now you are having a 12 months project. Now you are in the fourth month. So you need to do a cost to complete exercise. So the cost to complete exercise, cost to complete. Okay, to complete the job, how much it will cost. This is the meaning. So the total cost incurred up to this point, you will take from the CVR, right? Cost value reconciliation. You have, you are doing monthly that one. So you will be getting the total cost incurred up to that date. So the cost to complete mean you have a planned cost in the budget. That is a budget, right? In the initial stage, you have a planned cost, the planned one. Now you have up to the four month, you have the incurred cost. Say your budget is 100 million, that is number two. And up to now you have incurred 40 million. Right now, the balance 60 million is the cost to complete. So you have the cost to complete is 60 million. But what if the number one is greater than two minus three? <clears throat> Say, for example, your plan cost is 100 million. OK, 
okay uh, you have incurred up to now 40 million cost so you have only 60 million remaining to complete right but you can forecast <clears throat> as for the remaining works so you have up to now four months finish you have eight months you have some remaining works so but if you calculate the cost to the, this remaining works it is giving you 70 million <clears throat> but you have only budget is 60 million but you have 70 million cost forecast so that is the problem right so you maybe you have wasted some money your initial cost will be higher you did not plan properly so if is this situation if the cost to complete is greater than what cost you have for the remaining works your anticipated profit will be less right maybe you will be not losing a project but your anticipated profit <clears throat> you have to allocate some money to complete your works from your profit right <clears throat> so in that case <clears throat> if you're getting in this such scenario situation you have to you do a work study what is what happened why this is happening and you have to utilize the if, if it is the problem because RACS maybe they will ask this question like if you face a such situation how you will advise your employer or your contractor then you have to first tell we, we need to do a work study what is where is the problem so if it is a problem with the utilization of resources so we need to advise the site team the construction manager the project manager to utilize the resources effective or uh, if that is in order we need to see uh, to use some possibility to alternative materials right maybe uh, you are using some material so for the remaining works if we can get approval from the consultant to use an alternative material which will be a cost saving you have to think about it and as we said before you need to negotiate with uh, your supply chain for the remaining materials just you need to take maybe some discounts or you need to take some payment relief for, from the subcontractor so that will be also one of the solution and uh, as we discussed, uh, you have to go for value engineering. Uh, you need to propose some value engineering to the client. So the initial cost, you can reduce some costs from there. And importantly, as I said before, you need to expedite the works and try to complete the project as soon as possible. So you can reduce more cost. So you can avoid unnecessary cost because sometimes you are using your, your plant will be idling there will be the resources your project management team will be idling so once you complete the work as soon as possible you can avoid those costs <clears throat> the third one <clears throat> this is also an important uh, aspects of uh, cost reporting we call earned value analysis so this recently being used here we are there in cvr we use the cost and value right but here we are adding another element, uh, the time. So we are comparing here the end value analysis. We are comparing cost value with time. Okay, I will explain with an example, then you will be understand this. So <clears throat> as the time involved, the performance can be checked. So it is simply comparing the value plan and actual, uh, uh, cost plan and actual. So this is the difference. There we compare cost plus value cost and value only but here we are comparing planned value versus actual value the planned value is the program from the program the actual one is the progress okay i will i made a simple example for you to understand this end value analysis <clears throat> say project budget is 200 million okay this is budget okay not the value this is a budget the contractor budget project duration is 12 months now we are in this stage six months completed okay Just assume six months completed so as per the program <clears throat> we have planned for these six months 50 percent work to be completed but the actual progress is 40 so this is happening so you cannot expect the exact progress 
so the planned value so what, then what is the planned value so we planned 50 percentage our budget is 200 million so the planned value is 100 million right this is planned for six months but the actual cost from your cost records for a CVR or whatever is showing 90 million <clears throat> So the earned value is, the earned value, formula for the earned value is the actual progress into budget at completion. Okay. So the actual progress is 40 percentage and your budget at completion is the 200 million is your budget. So the earned value <clears throat> at this point of time is 80 million. Okay. I think you understood this one. So we have two... <clears throat> uh, two uh, elements to calculate this uh, performance. One we call scheduled variance. The scheduled variance we mean is the related to the time. Okay, say earned value, this is earned. We earned from this project minus the planned value, right? So what we earned is 80 million. This is our earned value. But what we plan to earn at this point of time is 100 million. So we earned 80 minus 100, so minus 20 million. So it means we are behind the schedule. <clears throat> so why behind the schedule is the progress is 40, right? We plan 50. So from that we know we are behind the schedule because we earned less than what we supposed to earn. Then the cost variance is the earned value minus actual cost. So in the cost wise, earned value is 80, actual cost is 90, so the minus 10 million. So this means we have over budgeted. So that means we use, we are behind our uh, intended cost, what we have spent at this time. So I will tell you the difference. The CVR is value versus cost, right? This at a given point of time. That is clear for you. You will compare the value, what you are getting from the client, and you will compare the cost, then you will have the profit. But this earned value analysis, what they, what does this mean? What value could have been done? What value could have been done? So in our previous example, we have earned planned value, right? There is a planned value, 90 million. And what cost could have been incurred? At the given point of time. So at the given point of time, what value should be there and what cost should be spent? So we are comparing with the time. So this is the difference between CVR and end value analysis. So this is one of the cost comparison tool uh, in a commercial management perspective. <laughs> right? So these are the, I have listed some risk uh, when we are preparing the cost reporting, so available information, uh, inputs, under over measured item, WBS, use of technology, correct use of changes. So these are the risks. So uh, you cannot avoid these risks, so, but you have to manage these items. For example, this cost reporting uh, all depend on the available information and your input. So if you are not properly use your data and information, or if you are if your input is something wrong somewhere, or you have measured uh, some item you under measured, some item you over measured, so that will not uh, represent properly. So that's why these are the risk in cost reporting. So when you are doing cost reporting, you should be uh, taking into consideration of these uh, all facts. All right, now we are coming to the end of our presentation. So this is the last item in the agenda, uh, the commercial decision make. So what is this? Uh, now we have talked about uh, many uh, aspects of commercial management, right? We are talking about uh, estimate and budgets. We are talking about value engineering. Uh, we have talked about um, cost reporting. We are talking about cash flow, uh, right? So we have talked about so many things. So these, all of these uh, things, all of these procedures, for an important uh, purpose, that is the decision making. So to make a proper decision, to make a proper commercial decision, 
we have to use all of these procedures in the commercial manager management in a proper way. So, as I said here, all of the above process and procedures are to make prompt important decisions in commercial management perspective, right? The decisions and lesson and objectives can be effectively used for future projects. Say, if you if we look, uh, make some mistakes in our current project, if we did not use properly these uh, norms and standards, but this will be helpful. These are the lesson learned objectives. This can be used in our future projects, so that can be effectively uh, materialized in the future projects, right? So the records of these procedures and processes are very crucial for future references. This is the lesson learned. And these are the tender stage. Uh, uh, I explained you before also to be considered in the pre-contract stage uh, before doing the tender. I'll be sharing this uh, slide, so maybe you can have it, right? <coughs> then these are the post-tender stage. What are the things to be considered uh, before awarding the project? Uh, because if you see this one, once you submit the tender, the commercial manager's duty will not be over. So the company still requires some time. If the company feel that this is a potential, potential project, they will ask the commercial manager to do further exercises on this one, clarification, negotiation, cash flow forecasting, allocation of resources, mobilization, this all before awarding the contract. In advance, the company may do. <coughs> right, this is the overview of this commercial management. So this is the important one, the cost and value. This is, we are playing with cost and value in the commercial management. So if anything happen, if your cost is more than a value, so because the value is the one you are getting, the cost is your spending. So always should be cost, value should be more than the cost, right? Or at least should be equal for a break even. But if the cost is more than value, you have to do a work study and you have to think about changing the delivery strategy or construction methodology. For an example, if you are uh, doing a block work, for an example, if you are doing yourself, your company with your company resources, maybe you can think about subcontracting it. So because of the company resources, the company labors, they sometimes they are lazy, you know, if, you are, if there's no supervision, they'll be doing their own way. But if you are giving to the subcontractor, the productivity, and you can quickly, uh, you can finish the block work. So you need to think about uh, to change the delivery strategy. So, or vice versa, if you are giving, if you, if you give a subcontracting for waterproofing, for example, and you feel that it is costing more and, uh, or uh, it is, they are not doing properly. So you can uh, take in between, or you can uh, use your own people to do the waterproofing for some other areas, or at least you can use for the future projects, this strategy. Then uh, you need to find the value engineering options to reduce the cost if the cost is more than value. And uh, you should try to negotiate with your supply chain. So the supply chain, you should be always uh, have a good relationship, right? And uh, if it is a financial issue, you need to see how to find an alternative funding and you need to think about it uh, with lesser uh, impact to the company. Uh, for that case only, you can uh, go for the organizational cash flow. So if the company having some other uh, projects, if you can take excess money from there, that will be a good option. So finally, you need to follow the norms and standards. So if you follow the norms and standards, as I explained earlier, uh, you will be puzzle free and you will be uh, having less uh, disputes and less issues. So you can, uh, any issues that can be resolved easily. Okay, with that note, uh, I wish you good luck uh, in your APC uh, assessment and APC uh, journey. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, I think the questions, as I told you, we are already uh, run beyond the schedule. Uh, please feel free to uh, 
direct your questions to the organizers or if they can transfer uh, convey to me i will be trying my best to uh, give you some uh, answers okay so uh, that's it from my side thank you very much and uh, good night